My name is Carlton Cartwright. I'm the Executive Director for the Veterans Memorial and Multicultural Histories Incorporated. Today is January 15th, 2022. Uh, it's Saturday. And Miss, what is your name? My name is Cynthia Elaine Cook. Okay. And what rank were you when you separated from the military? Or are you separated? I am. I am retired and I am a colonel. United States Army. Right. Okay, and um, why did you choose the Army? So I chose the Army because uh, at the time that uh, I was in college, uh, one year of college, I saw an advertisement come on television about joining the Army for two years and you could obtain $17,500 and educational benefits. So my initial reason for going into the military was to obtain uh, the benefits for the education for my undergraduate degree. Okay, and where were you? What were you doing before you went to service? So before I enlisted into the active duty army, I was in college, my first year in college in Clearwater at St. Petersburg Junior College. Mm -hmm. What were you majoring in? At that time I was just majoring in uh, it basically to get my associates in arts degree so that I could transfer later to the University of South Florida to get my undergraduate degree in political science. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, So you were, you, were a, you were a student when you enlisted? Correct. Were you in the ROTC program? I was not in the ROTC program. I received my commission through the Florida Army National Guard uh, Officer Candidate School Military Academy. And where did you attend? So you went in as an officer? So originally I went in enlisted. Okay. I was a 71 Lima, which is an administrative assistant. Mm -hmm. I got out of the Army, active duty. I joined the Florida Army National Guard. Within a year of being in the Florida Army National Guard, a wonderful gentleman by the name of Master Sergeant Wesley Lawson recommended me for Officer Candidate School, which is how I ended up in the Florida National Guard Military Academy, OCS, Officer Candidate School Program, to receive my commissioning. What was, um, what was, what was officers training OTS? Officer Candidate School Training. Oh, yes. It was pretty intense. It was uh, approximately 15 months long mm -hmm. and a reserve status or a National Guard status. Mm -hmm. So one week in a month we would go to uh, Camp Landing training site in Florida to attend uh, the academy, Officer Candidate School Academy. And it was almost like going to Fort Benning, Georgia for the active duty Officer Candidate School program there which was six weeks long, but the Florida National Guard program for Officer Candidate School was equivalent to that in that 15-month period. Okay. So we did two weeks initially, one week in a month, and then another two weeks to graduate, which equated to the uh, six weeks that it would normally take to do the Officer Candidate School. Okay. Okay, so you, you, you were on reserve status. Correct. Okay. During that time. What was your civilian job? Did you have a civilian job? I did. Actually, during that time, you were able to go to the officer candidate school before you'd finish up your undergraduate degree. Uh, the agreement was that you would continue on with your undergraduate degree even after graduating from officer candidate school. There was an exception made uh, in order to do the officer candidate school. But by the time I had joined the officer uh, candidate school or was selected for officer candidate school, I had completed my uh, associate's degree. Mm -hmm. I was a full-time student and I was working part-time. All right, um, so tell me about your um, your two weeks, uh, you know, your once, one weekend a month, mm -hmm. right, and your two weeks out of the year, where did you deploy to? Later on in my career, I was a major and I deployed to Kuwait. So I was in between Camp Erfjan, Kuwait, mm -hmm. Kuwait Naval Base, and Port Shweba, Kuwait, mm -hmm. which is where we did sustainment logistical operations 
uh, in that particular region. We were supporting the warfighter who were moving up into theater, into Iraq, and those who were stationed in uh, Kuwait as well. Okay. Did you see any combat? I did not see any direct combat. However, we were impacted by uh, some of the folks that were there, i.e. ISIS. Uh, from the standpoint of finding cash, we had roadside bombings that were taking place in Kuwait that we had to be aware of. Uh, so, uh, sometimes our installations were shut down for that very reason. Things were still pretty hot and heavy going on in theater and we were still impacted by what was going on even though we were removed from Iraq. The um, ISIS and some of the other organizations were still able to get into, the into Kuwait somehow, some way to make an impact or try to make an impact on us. Okay, um, so go back for a minute, casualties going through um, your military training initially, mm -hmm. uh, including yourself, any injuries, any casualties in training school? Uh, we did not, I was very fortunate and blessed that I did not have any injuries mm -hmm. um, during combat or during the training when I joined the military. So I'm grateful for that. Uh, we were very fortunate. We didn't have any casualties mm -hmm. within our organization. We knew of other units that were having casualties or people wounded in combat, but our organization did not. Even though we had folks going up into Iraq, everybody made it back home safely. So not within, but without, so to speak, um, what types and kinds of casualties did you see from other units or organizations? Well, I didn't personally see any of those uh, combat injuries. Um, I knew about them through other people who talked about what they had witnessed during that time frame. So we were still serving with a lot of the folks that had seen combat and were returning to Kuwait for different reasons because they had went up into Iraq, uh, dealing with transportation, transporting uh, equipment into Iraq. And so those individuals were coming back and telling us about the combat that they had seen or they had witnessed so during that time frame. How long were you stationed in Kuwait? I was there for 12 months. Okay, all right. <clears throat> and um, what is the length of time? You, you retired from the, the, the Army, correct? Correct. All right. And over what period of time? So I served in the military from being enlisted to getting commissioned as an officer for a combination of 34 years. One of those years was uh, in the inactive, or nine months was inactive ready reserves, but a total of 34 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. 34 years? Yes. Okay, so um, where, where, besides Kuwait, and where did you travel? during the period of your time in the service? So I started out at uh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina mm -hmm. when I was enlisted. Then I moved from Fort Jackson, South Carolina to Fort Leonardwood, Missouri. Mm -hmm. Served there and then got out, joined the Florida Army National Guard and served in St. Petersburg, Florida in the National Guard. Then transitioned from there to Orlando, Florida and served with the 3347th uh, Training Support Battalion uh, that supported combat, sustainment, uh, service support units or companies, getting them prepared for combat or getting them ready to deploy. Once I completed my assignment there, I ended up deploying uh, overseas mm -hmm. for the one year. After completing that assignment, the next assignment that was a part of that was working at United States Central Command at McDill Air Force Base where I was a logistics officer and supported the strategy plans and policy organization at that point. Right. Then after I completed the, my assignment there, I moved on to the, um, I got selected for battalion command and then I went back to a unit in Orlando where I served uh, as the battalion commander. It was a training support battalion. And shortly after serving as the battalion commander there, I moved on and was selected as a uh, brigade commander for a unit out of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, known as the 321st Sustainment Brigade. After I completed that assignment, I moved on and became the chief of staff for the 364th Expeditionary Sustainment Command out of Marysville, Washington. So. 
the culmination of my assignments ended in Marysville, Washington as the Chief of Staff of the 364th Expeditionary Sustainment Command. Okay, besides, um, yeah, and I do mean uh, specifically, uh, in your civilian life, yes. where, where are all the places you, that you've traveled in the world? So that actually, um, I've traveled actually during my assignment, I've traveled to Japan, uh, and uh, I've traveled to Qatar, mm -hmm. and of course I've traveled to Kuwait. Mm -hmm. So those were some of the big places that I've traveled to. In my private life, I've traveled to Canada, so, and of course, pretty much all over the United States of America. That's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much. Okay. Yeah. Moving right along. Um, accommodations and medals. Yes, so I have a plethora of them. So it depends on where you want me to start. So you can start when I was enlisted. I had the Army Service Ribbon. I have the Army Commendation Medal, the Army Achievement Medal. I have the Joint Service uh, Achievement Medal, Joint Service Commendation Medal. I received the, um, the Defense Meritorious Service Medal, uh, which is joint award, some of the ones that I'm naming. Humanitarian Service Award from when I was serving in the uh, National Guard, uh, Global War on Terrorism, the Meritorious Service Medal, which is what I received when I was deployed, and the culmination of all of those awards led to the Legion of Merit, which is what I received at retirement. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, have you had any experiences uh, that have been negative um, in regards to you being uh, a woman in the service? Yes, actually I, I shared this story a while back. I, I remember when I was going through officer candidate school, one of the, the probably most negative things that I encountered was one of the instructors at the officer candidate school uh, kept referring to women as, you know, nurses and that that was the only career field that we would be a part of. and. Uh, we reported him. So we were the largest female class to ever go through the Florida Army National Guard. There was 10 of us. We graduated with seven. Two were African American, the other five were other, other ethnic backgrounds. And as a, you know, learning from that event uh, made us realize that some people, men in particular, did not necessarily, necessarily want women serving in other roles outside of the nursing profession. But of course we proved them wrong because those women went on and got commissioned and went on to do other things within the military, to include myself. How about as far as you being a woman of color? So being a woman of color has its own unique challenges throughout my career. What I learned to do was not to allow the color of my skin to prevent me from pursuing my passion or what I was really, really good at, or at least I, I felt I was good at, which were leading, mentoring, coaching, teaching soldiers, and understanding every aspect of logistics and sustainment operations that were required to be successful in my career field. So being a woman of color and being African American in particular, it definitely had its challenges. Um, Sometimes individuals did not say anything directly to you about being African American, but there were a lot of subtleties, subtle un undertones um, amongst people of different ethnic backgrounds or males in particular that uh, were undercurrents to preclude, preclude you from maybe being as successful as you could be. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, uh, to be honest with you, a lot of the things that I encountered that were negative, I did not allow those to keep me from doing what I needed to do to be successful within the military. Okay, as um, any time that you were on uh, active duty, uh, weekends or you know the two weeks out of the year, was there ever any any, any issue or the time the entire time you were in Kuwait? Uh, have you, was there any challenge as far as being able to stay in touch with your family? Yes, there, there were some challenges when in two, between 2004 and 2005. Uh, we had challenges because uh, you couldn't really see your family 
but they had uh, what they call video teleconferences on a little monitor mm -hmm. that was super, super small. I mean, they're maybe 12, 13 inches, right? Mm -hmm. And the beauty of that is it was fuzzy video camera coming through that you could actually see them, but oftentimes the quality was very poor. Right. You could talk to your family on the phone, but visually you had very few opportunities to do that because the systems were down more so than they were up. So, but uh, we stayed in contact via telephone calls, occasionally emails, and then when the opportunity presented itself, we would do a video teleconferencing as well. Okay. Um, I just uh, interviewed your husband. Mm -hmm. um, did you have difficulty staying in touch with him while the both of you were wherever you may have been? So I, um, I made it a point to call at least every other day and sometimes once a week uh, to make sure we stay connected. We had a young daughter at the time who was 15 months old when I had to deploy. Uh, that was one of the toughest things I had to do. Uh, but we stayed in contact as often, as frequently as possible under the circumstances. Okay. Um, if you don't mind me asking, uh, how many children do you have? I have the one child, mm -hmm. my husband and I. We only have the one child. Okay. Been. And. I'm just curious, the, was there interference, so to speak, due to, you know, I'm, I'm not exactly sure, but anyway, um, were there any challenges having a child with both of you in the service? No, there, there was never really an issue uh, with that. It, our schedules just were super busy. Uh, we planned uh, our daughter <laughs> entrance into the world, and so we were very grateful for that. We did not concern ourselves with the timing of what was about to happen in the world, so I just happened to be expecting during the time shortly after 9-11, mm -hmm. and so the I was supposed to deploy shortly the same year that I was pregnant with her because of the unit I was assigned to. Um, but everything unfolded while I was pregnant. So I didn't end up deploying with the first iteration of the 143rd uh, Transcom is what they were called at the time. Now they're the 143rd Expeditionary Sustainment Command. Right. But I did not deploy because I, was, I just had a child. Mm -hmm. Shortly thereafter, however, I, as I uh, mentioned earlier, 15 months later, I was on the list to deploy with uh, my higher headquarters. So I was cross-leveled into the higher headquarters and then deployed as a supply management officer. Okay. And is, was that your role when you went overseas? Yes, actually my role as a supply management officer actually shifted and changed when I hit the ground. Uh, so on my orders that uh, deployed me down seas, overseas, we thought because the orders indicated we were going to Southwest Asia, we thought we didn't know where we were going mm -hmm. because it included all of the countries in the CENTCOM AOR or area of operations, area of responsibility. So that included about 20, 21 countries at the time. So when we got to Kuwait, we did not know where we were going. We didn't know if we were going to be in Kuwait or we we're going to be in Iraq. So when we got there, some of our units, part of our unit went up into Iraq doing some sustainment transportation operations and part stayed behind. As a supply management officer, I ended up staying behind because there was, um, there was a requirement to stand at what they call a joint operations center. So myself and five other people were selected to remain in Kuwait to stand at a joint operations center for the Kuwait, to a place where the Kuwaitis could come and interact on their own turf, on their own area, with Americans and military soldiers. Oh, thank you. All right. Yeah. Oh, because I moved. <laughs> You're going to edit that, right? I'll work on it. Okay. <laughs> thank you. So you were, by the grace of God, you were never a prisoner of war? No, I was never a prisoner of war. Okay. Fabulous. Um, oh. Were you included in any battle planning? 
I was included uh, on the pre before we deployed. Once we got on the ground, we were in meetings on a weekly basis that provided us updates, intel updates of what was going on on a regular basis that we participated in. And then there were other meetings that we were a part of as well as it relates to um, what we were responsible for doing on the ground at that particular time. So that varied based upon the mission set and the mission requirements. Uh, so, you know, we went from focusing on um, bringing uh, at the Port of Schweba, bringing in equipment, offloading equipment, and then pushing those troops forward into Iraq mm -hmm. through Kuwait to now I'm over in the uh, doing the stand up of the Joint Operations Center. So I was selected to do that. So before we left, the Kuwaitis and the American soldiers were able to, you know, interact and enjoy, uh, have meetings in a place, a safe place, if you will. Okay. Um, how was the food, by the way? Actually, the food in Kuwait, um, I have no complaints. It was actually pretty good. Okay. Um, we. The food we had when I, by the time I got on the ground in Kuwait was already stood up. It was contracted feeding at that point. So at that, you know, at that point things were pretty much running fairly smoothly mm -hmm. with getting food uh, into theater and being able to take care of the troops that were there on the ground. During your um, your deployment there, did you feel or experience? Um, any additional stress? I think one of the biggest stressors that I had was working with some of uh, my peers on the ground. Mm -hmm. So that sometimes was challenging because you, we were a part of a unit that was not organic to itself. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of people cross-leveled into this particular detachment from all over the United States. So we all had to get to know each other, had to uh, understand each other's working styles, how much information people knew, how well they did their jobs was quite, that was more of a challenge probably than anything else that I had to deal with when I was in theater, so. You feel like um, when you, especially in that situation, but even really throughout your career, you feel like you always had uh, all the supplies that you needed? Did the Army have you fully equipped? I believe the Army did what was required to ensure we were equipped to do our jobs effectively. When I showed up in theater, we literally received more equipment than I think I could possibly use during the time that I was there. Okay. Uh, some of the items were you know, definitely beneficial uh, to us necessary to include our flat vests that were we had to wear every day that protected us for potential threats, i.e. Uh, by you know whoever it was that we had to be concerned by, about during the time that we were on the ground. Okay. Um, in your civilian job, um, what was it again? So, in my civilian job, you mean throughout my career? Yeah. So, there was different parts of my career that took place. Originally, um, when I first joined the military, of course, I told you as a college student, transitioned to working for a Fortune 500 company in management. Um, and it was one of the largest uh, computer distribution com companies in the, in the country. And I worked for them in management for about seven years. Mm -hmm. Transitioned to deployment, came back, and then started, stayed in uniform, active duty on in uniform, and active status for about seven, eight years. Mm -hmm. And I segue to uh, what I currently do now, which is, you know, dealing with human capital and budgets uh, within um, Central Command and the Operations Directorate. That are you so you still you you're a GS correct. Uh, I'm still working in the civilian sector. Right. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um. Where uh, oh did um so GI Bill. 
Uh, how extensive have you used that? How extensive? I depleted the GI Bill. <laughs> so as I mentioned earlier in our conversation, part of the reason why I went into the military was that purpose, but then I grew to love the military, what it represented, uh, the patriotism, the camaraderie, the commitment, the selfless servants that I had the privilege of working with every single day. There were some phenomenal people that I met and have established some great, wonderful relationships with over the years. So um, with that GI Bill, I completely exhausted it. Uh, the military gave me $17,500 to pay for. It paid for my undergraduate degree and it paid for part of my master's degree. What I did receive was a post 9-11 GI Bill uh, benefit of which I transferred to our daughter Brianna to pay for her undergraduate education. So how did you, by the way, overall, how has the military affected your life? So the military has had its challenges. Um, I think in a positive way the military has uh, affected my life and my family. It uh, has definitely had a lot of sacrifices that we've had to make over the years. Uh, being away from our family at really strange times during holidays, birthdays. So we missed out on a few things uh, along the way, but um, I personally I have no regrets. I'm just grateful, thankful for the opportunity to have served as long as I did. And then, of course, you know, I have family members who have served as well, and so I'm just grateful uh, that they chose to serve as well. Have you, have you maintained any of the close friendships that you made while in the military? Yes. Actually, one of my long-standing friends is a young lady by the name of Kim uh, Lyles Williams, and she and I met in officer candidate school, and still to this day, she and I are really, really good friends. We've kept in contact for over 30 years. Wow. She got out earlier, but we've stayed in contact over the years. And then I've met some, some amazing people along the way that I still stay in contact with right now. You've met a couple of those people today. Mm -hmm. um, Michelle Lacey and Diane Maline that I have served with and had the privilege of working with them. And then there's other folks too that you know I could mention that are in different places. Mm -hmm. um, one of the young ladies that I um, served with was um, like uh, Lieutenant Colonel Donye Smith. Uh, you have um, Lieutenant Colonel, well I don't know if she's not a Lieutenant Colonel anymore, I forgot. Uh, Colonel Doris um, Badon. She uh, was one of the battalion commanders who served underneath my leadership when I was a brigade commander, and now she's a full bird colonel as well. Okay. So, do you belong to any veterans organizations today? Currently, I do not belong to any veterans organization. I belong to uh, what is it, the Military Officers Association. I'm part of them, mm -hmm. um, but not any local chapters of uh, veterans organizations. Wait a minute. Yes, the one that Michelle stood up about five years ago. It's a Veterans Arc. It's a nonprofit organization. Pretty much veterans helping veterans. I don't know if she mentioned that in her interview, but yeah. So. Okay. Um, all right, well, did your military experience influence your thinking about war or about the military in general? think so. I, I think when I went in, I, I just knew I had to prepare myself mm -hmm. and be excellent at what I did and learn every aspect of logistics mm -hmm. in order to support the mission and the warfighter. And then didn't have the capability of leading those same people that I learned the same skill sets on early on, helping them understand the big picture and what was required to in order to support our mission downrange, okay. particularly when I was deployed, so. Okay. Um, how, did, um, how did your service and experiences affect your life in your, from your perspective? I think it's 
uh, affected me in a lot of ways. <laughs> it's taught me to be grateful and appreciative, appreciative of some of the, you know, the little things in life. Uh, uh, particularly when I was overseas, you know, you take a lot of things for granted here in America. But after deploying, um, you realize the, the significance, the importance of valuing your family, um, valuing every moment that you have with them because you don't know if you're coming back alive or not. So, and then you look at life from a different perspective. You realize that life is like a vapor. We may be here today and we might be gone tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And so we have to have an appreciation of the things that we have, and particularly here in America. I think we take a lot of things for granted. And my overseas experience in, um, during Operation Iraqi Freedom changed my perspective on why I serve. It made me realize that serving in the military was bigger than me and it was for a greater cause. Mm -hmm. And that's why being an American and we're able to be free mm -hmm. is why I serve. So I have an appreciation for serving now uh, for that very reason. You have anything else that you'd like to share that you may not have mentioned so far? Oh my goodness! You should I grab my folder and talk about <laughs> it? <laughs> I did write something down. I I just I I honestly am, am appreciative of this opportunity to just share a few words, mm -hmm. uh, particularly for you know the next generation, for the people that's coming behind me, uh, family, friends, fellow comrades, people that may serve but after me. And particularly African American women, I would say, you know, be authentic, be true to yourself. Don't change who you are just because of the environment that you're in. Know your job, know it well, do it with excellence, and speak in a well modulated voice and be smarter than anybody in the room. And uh, know that, and be confident of a couple of things that you're uniquely who you are because you're designed to be here for now to do what you're doing. So be a compliment to your organization. Everything's not about competition, but compliment the people around you. That's okay. all I have. Is there anything else? Are you sure? Yes. <laughs> what, what I'd like to say also is this. I, I'd like to thank the men and women who came before me, uh, I am really standing on their shoulders today that have served in the military. I want to thank um, the Women Army Corps who taught me about etiquette when I first joined the military. I want to thank uh, my, my father who's not with us anymore, who served as a, in the Korean War. I'm grateful for my mother who gave me life uh, and gave me an opportunity to be here to do what I'm doing today, sitting before you in this interview and serving in the military. Uh, I want to thank uh, Master Sergeant Wesley Lawson, who had enough faith and confidence in my abilities to recommend me to go to officer candidate school, which is why I'm here today. Had it not been for that pivotal moment in my career uh, as a E4 specialist at the time uh, being recommended for officer candidate school, I wouldn't be sitting here. And then, of course, I'd like to thank my husband Michael for supporting me. We were dual military for over 30 years together, mm -hmm. uh, who stood by me every step of the way, and uh, I'm grateful for that. And then, our wonderful, beautiful daughter Brianna, who was there during the sacrifices and was a real, real trooper and never complained when her mother was away, when her mother was serving, when her mother was serving in, um, you know, in command leadership positions and I had to be away or I was up late at night working on something or on a conference call helping other people through, you know, what the next operational plan was for our organization or preparation for our annual training that we were responsible for. 
Yes, I want to say thank you to her <laughs> and all the other trailblazers who came before me, right? right. Uh, that gave me this opportunity. But more importantly, you know, I honestly must say that most of the positions that I've served in in the military, I was the first. Okay. I was first. So although there were other trailblazers, I was also a trailblazer in my own right as well and the positions that I have served in uh, throughout my military career. So I'm grateful for having the opportunity to lead the way in that regards and uh, make a, be a difference maker in some capacity. Right. So. Well, I'm gonna thank you for a fabulous interview. Thank you. And I also wanna thank you for your service. Thank you. You're welcome. Can we stop it? Well, I'm still smiling. Oh my God, you have some editing to do. <laughs> Not a lot. <laughs>